We have folks trickling in. How many do you have registered? I think about 40, so it's a good. I did my marketing part. <laughs> <laughs> Great, <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you. Let me do this so that it's easier for me. Let's just go to another minute. It's weird. A little strange sense of nervousness to speak as if that's not something I have to do all the time. It's that waiting thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it must be. All right. Um, let's give it a, maybe 30 seconds and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, try and get my, ah, there we go. We have a Hawaiian shirt Friday thing around here. Oh, just for, I just thought it was your personal aesthetic. Yeah, no, I, I, I was doing it for a while. Then Jaime said, is this a Friday thing? So should I be doing it? So it's <laughs> and then you institute it as a, yeah. yeah you should have them come in the background behind you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This happens to be from Puerto Rico last time I was there. But you know, it's still the island theme. So. It definitely yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Welcome everyone. We're really excited to have you this Friday afternoon. My name is Xiomara Cisneros. I'm with the Bay Area Council and I'm also a board member of the Casita Coalition. And uh, I just wanted to thank everyone uh, for being a member of the Casita Coalition. And um, if you want to learn more about us, I'll go ahead and put the link into uh, the chat box, which everyone could see. Please visit casitacoalition.org. And uh, we chose a really great and interesting time to launch our membership drive. Um, but uh, with that said, we're very grateful for those of you who have joined. Uh, we really appreciate it given the circumstances. And uh, when you do join, you can see that it's at to your discretion and amount that is appropriate for you. Um, however, we also really embrace passion volunteers. So if you do not have the means, then you are honored as a member through the rest of 2020. And uh, for those who can contribute, your membership is valid and honored through the rest of 2021. So with that said, again, please visit casitopolition.org. Again, the link is in the chat box. And I especially want to thank our premier members, um, Barry Council, um, I'm uh, so supporting through uh, various efforts um, in my organization, uh, as well as AARP, CBIA, the California Builder Industry Association, CCB, California Community Builders, Great Star Development, and of course, we're really excited to receive the grant from CZI, the Chan Zuckerberg Institute. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to my fellow board member, June Grant, who will go ahead and introduce further herself and um, our speaker, Steve Ayos. Hi, Jim Mark, thank you. Um, I'm gonna have Steve introduce himself, and then I'll introduce myself and just launch into the questions. So Steve, wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, sure. So um, my name is Steve Leos. I'm the um, owner of two companies, uh, Valley Home Development, which is a construction company, and Prefab ADU, which is an ADU um, kit building company. Um, I've been in the ADU space for 15 years, designing and building ADUs. Um, I, my companies have done several hundred now um, across all nine Barry counties and over 40 cities and on up into the foothills and stretching out a little further north, south, and east. Um, and we've been actively involved in ADU legislation, advocacy, um, pretty much anything that has to do with ADU. We're really trying to help move it along as an industry. And so with that, I, you know, I, I became a member of the Casita Coalition with the intentions of continuing to help with things that are barriers and um, as well as, you know, working with other members on any, anything I can do to give them good ideas and advice on how to succeed. Great. And for, for those who don't know me, um, June Grant, founder and principal of Blink Lab Architecture, um, current president of the National Organization of Minority Architects Bay Area Chapter, and one of the four founding members, uh, board members of Casitas Coalition. And Steve and I know each other 
I got it seems like almost two years now since our fateful phone call two years ago when I called to ask about his prefab in-law unit he had built in, in my neighborhood. Um, and we have had several conversations over the years. Uh, the most recent one was last week. But we've also become like this duo where we did the AIA webinar last December. So I'm seeing this conversation, recorded conversation as a, as a part two in an ongoing discussion. Um, so, so I want to start with, you've been in this business of trying to promote in-law units, ADUs, granny flats for more than 20 years. And um, what are you seeing since we passed new legislature, the original ones in 2016, and now that we have four new ones, what are you seeing as the um, struggles that cities are encountering as they try to implement some of these new ordinances? What are you seeing when you compare some of the cities? Because you work across the entire Bay Area. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I see a lot of cities just struggling with the fact that we have code changes. And it's a it's a big undertaking, and it's um, it's very difficult for them to um, to keep up with making those adjustments. Uh, and when you're talking about ADUs, you're talking about you know four to six pieces of legislation that they have to overlay and understand what that means to them and an impact. You also see them struggling with you know a um, an uptick in in ADU applications, which means that it's a it's a constraint on staff. Um, so I, I think like with anything, when we see changes in code, we see um, the struggle with the adoption um, and then the interpretation. And I think the, the latter part of it is, is also somewhat of a challenge in a lot of places. Um, code is always open for interpretation. So that means that um, even within a city, you may have different planners who view things differently. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's a challenge internally even for the staff to get to a point where they all have an agreement on exactly how something should be interpreted and applied to not only a specific ADU application, but broadly across all ADU applications. So, so you, we, we had a conversation where you, I wanna jog your memory a little bit. We had a conversation where you, I think it was San Jose, where they had an ordinance that allowed, I think it was minimum 800 square feet as the in-law unit. And you, and you pushed back and said, well, how do you see this working to provide the number of units that I can't remember a conversation, but I found that one to be rather interesting because 800 square feet is larger than in my mind, what I see as an in-law unit. And yet that was their minimum. Did they change? It wasn't well, that, so how did you encourage them to change? That's, that's, let me provide some clarity on that in case there's some San Jose people online listening. <laughs> badly of them. I think they're a great city and, and we love working with them. But what the constraint was, was that eight, I think around 800 square feet was the, was the minimum allowed for a two bedroom configuration. And what we saw is we did some analysis on their, um, on, on their whole city, the number of lots that have single family homes um, and then the lot sizes. And what we did is we helped them understand that there's a, there's, a, um, there's a gap between what you're allowing and what possibly could be done. And so what, what we try to do is provide information so that they can be better educated about the decisions they're making about where and what is allowed. In that, in that specific instance, what we did is we showed them that there was a, the, the largest portion of their, their, their single family homes, I, I wanna say it was something like 60%, represented a lot size where maybe something like a 600 to 650 square foot ADU with two bedroom would be more applicable. But the other, the 800 square foot probably wouldn't work under, you know, things like lot utilization um, and such. So when we help cities understand better what their um, capacity for ADUs mm -hmm. are um, and what and, and help enlighten them on what the consumer's mindset is, both with size and economics, then the city can make better decisions about what they should be allowing and where. And so our, our goal as an industry is to not fight with cities, but to really understand them that this is an alliance and that we have to work better to communicate what we're seeing in the field so that they can make better decisions. So as a result of that conversation, did they make changes where they allow, did they then understand, oh, the 
we need to make adjustments in how we are writing the zoning ordinance or their parameters did they was the change immediate or did it take a few more time six to daylight the issues that need to be changes so the changes were immediate and I, and I will say this um, whenever you whenever the mayor's office reaches out to you about questions um, I, I think you have you much you have a much more willing organization to make adjustments now I do not want to say that disparagingly because I, I think very highly of the senior staff at um, at planning and building mm -hmm. within the city it's just the question came to me from the mayor's office and so the answer came to them from the mayor's, office. The mayor's office. But what happened there is that opened up dialogue it, it, it instituted a, a, a session between uh, my team and the city about these things and and with that they were very receptive to understanding things that they weren't considering uh, and they made the changes swiftly so much so that um, one of our plans that we call the David which is 640 square feet it's a two-bedroom plan mm -hmm. was immediately adopted as a pre-approved plan with, with the city in fact it was the first pre-approved plan with the city so there is there's tremendous opportunity to work with cities and not see them necessarily as the barrier, but to see them as the gatekeeper to our industry success if we help them with the right information. Right. So how, do you know what the impact, if, if there have been um, plans purchased or how many in-law units have come on, been applied using your plans, the new pre-approved plans, and are there other pre-approved approved plans there, so we helped them try and institute a pre-approved plan program and mm -hmm. and the intent wasn't to you know try and isolate them into a relationship with us or, or something like that it was to help them understand doing something in the way that was more of an open architecture that would allow good solutions that fit the city's goals and needs to be moved forward into that pre-approved plan system so yes there are other pre-approved plans within the city mm -hmm. and from what i understand some of them are doing quite well i think we've we've got a, i don't know like a half a dozen or up to a dozen of the david plans that are moving through the system that's great so so it it, it, it opens up tremendous opportunity for the homeowners and that's at the end of the day this is really about setting up wins for the homeowners which ultimately sets up wins for the city have you been able to translate that success with San Jose to other cities in explaining some of the pitfalls in some of their ordinances or how they're approaching or understanding what's applicable or what's what's possible versus what's been planned or what policy is saying? I, I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to say both directly and indirectly. I, I, I've had, you and I have had conversations about the many consultants in this industry I've had lots of dialogue with a lot of a lot of those firms about different ideas about you know gathering information to help cities and counties make better assessments of their code. And so we're doing things directly, having dialogue with cities as well as all these other entities. And what's happening is is, is things that are things are opening up with the cities, not only reception to ADU, but with the understanding that. Um, they they have an opportunity to do much better if they get a deeper understanding and knowledge of what the market needs and so yeah. i'm i'm I, I tell you 15 years of doing this um from two, 2017 on it's been a totally different environment in terms of how you converse with cities um in a much more positive way early on in the early early years of doing this it was a fight it was a mm -hmm. dog fight sometimes with cities to try and get ADUs in and approved um, because there was a lot of resistance to this. And I, I think, you know, not that the cities hated them or didn't want them at all, but there was a certain fear established about mm -hmm. what this potentially could do to the single family home market. Well, it sounds like there might be a uh, avenue or possibility for Casitas to be where we're starting to share some of your successes with various cities so that each city is learning from one central source. Um, that's a public source so that they know where to go rather than let's call Steve. <laughs> but, but we start to sh have a pool where, where success stories and some of the struggles are being, are being housed so that everyone can learn so from some of those successes and, and virus. I want to pivot a little bit to focus more on your uh, prefab 
mm -hmm. and codes. And talk to me about what are you experiencing or what are the successes or barriers you're experiencing in terms of getting prefab ADUs built? And I know that's a broad question. <laughs> so, if, so if you want to say in San Jose, this is what I encounter, that's fine too. If you want to make it city specific or if you want to say that, you know, at the state level, what are your biggest challenges and probably one of your best successes? Well, I'll start with saying that um, I've been doing this with prefab literally from day one, 15 years ago. Right. So, so for me, my successes have been all along the path, but my challenges have been there as well. And they were much more significant early on. They, they become less of a challenge as we, as we progress. Generally speaking, when we talk about cities and we talk about prefab in general, when we talk about prefab, think of it as an umbrella and okay. underneath it is things like manufactured home, modular homes, panelized homes, SIPs, um, the things that they're working on now, like these uh, 3D printed concrete, yep. and on and on. And on. There's, there's lots of different varieties of, of what falls under prefab. Um, but generally speaking, the, early, the earliest of stages of prefab products um, were much easier in counties than they were in cities. And, mm. and honestly enough, there's, a, there's an easy reason why. Counties cater to rural properties much right. more. And rural properties have, have been synonymous with more use of manufactured and modular homes. So you, you generally have a staff that's more, that has been in the early days, much more knowledgeable about that product set. Right. Um, as we go into urban areas, these things tend to be new, even for senior level um, plan checkers. And so there's often a, a confusion about what is involved in the plan check process as well as the inspection process. Yeah. It, it, it leads to scenarios where there's a lot of need for, for interaction with third party assistance through groups like HCD to help cities understand. Instead of me trying to cram down and throat what their rules are and their laws are, it's much easier for me to connect them with a reference so that they can work through those issues based on what I see as interpretations and then getting that clearly from a, th a third party rep from the, from the state side of things. And so that's made things a lot easier as the years progress. And what I think is as we progress, the domino and the ripple effect starts to reach out into other areas and, and cities become more receptive of this technology because they know that speed and economics play in favor of the consumer. And quite honestly, it's a little less burdening on their staff on the plan check and the, and the building inspection process because most of that is happening at another level outside of, outside so, of their work. So we should probably explain to many who don't realize that prefab requires, there's a state component, state approval component because it's a product and the city permit approval, which then is usually where the ambiguity and uh, misunderstanding as to who has jurisdiction over what. Um, what was the biggest, where, where, where do you find, you know, where do you find that there's some confusion between the two? Where is that most likely to happen? Um, it, it starts with first the technology that you're using. So if you're, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a big difference between manufactured versus modular versus panelized versus SIPs in terms of what that product is and what the local jurisdiction holds right. responsibility. So um, that's where the starting point is. And that's your first point of do we have a red flag with what's going on with the city as I turn in an application. Um, so that's that's the first point, and you you usually get a clear understanding of that on the on the on the first round of comments that come back, and that's usually how many pages long? Right, right. If you if, if for instance, if I turned in a manufactured home as an ADU, mm -hmm. and I got you know uh, you know seven pages with thirty six comments on it, I'm usually and, and and you're looking at this going, okay, there's a there's a clear lack of understanding about what their role is. Um, so that's, that's the first point of where you get into some confusion. Um, the second point is where, as they start to dig through that, getting some clarity on things like foundation, jurisdiction, responsibilities, um, the transportation, the delivery, the set of, of, of homes, who, what, what role does the city play in, in, the, in the inspection process? Mm -hmm. um, and what role do they back away from and take into consideration that certain components here have already been inspected? And so, 
Are there cities where you're finding they're better prepared or on their, on their other cities? I'm just looking at the Bay Area. Are there cities that you could say, you know what? Um, Vallejo is ready. They've got a good team. Oakland could do a little bit of tuning. If you were to rate where, because we're all learning. So it's right. not a knock on each city. It's just, an, a, a, as you say, awareness. So if you were to, you know, rank, quote, quote unquote, rank where cities are in terms of prefab approval, inspection, familiarity, who would you say is best prepared right now? And who? That's a, that's a hard one because, you know, just like project workloads ebb and flow, gotcha. staff within a city um, changes. And, and so, you know, you, you could, we did some early work with Oakland and it was, it was literally like a walk in the park. And, and then, you know, we've gone through ups and downs in economics. Mm -hmm. um, so there's staff changes and, and new people come aboard and some senior people, you know, sometimes retire out. And so you get this, um, you get an instant change in, in, in the, in the reception and, 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 and then the, review and approval process. So it, it is a, it's a challenging thing to say easily. There has been some cities that we, you know, we, we've eased through from beginning to just recently. Cities like Walnut Creek, for some reason, out of nowhere, I wouldn't have expected it, but um, we've done very well with, with various kinds of prefab solutions. Nice. Um, and Oakland still remains one of those cities where um, generally speaking, things, things go, pretty pretty well um, with it. When we run into hiccups, they're receptive to dialogue with HCD for clarity, mm -hmm. and then we move on, you know. So, so I, I think there's a lot of cities now that um, we're running into less, less issues with this than we did, you know, even five years ago. That's great to hear. Uh, yeah. Let me start making progress. All right, my, my third question, um, reach codes. Because we got the new 2020 CBC, I know. Being a sustainable designer, I was very excited about the 2020 CBC and then reach codes and in-law units. And that just forced a whole design of all my floor plans. So let's talk about reach codes for a little bit. <laughs> so, so reach code, let me do a quick overview so people yes. understand it. Re yes. Reach code is basically where cities are taking the position that they want to dump gas from all homes, new construction. Yeah. Um, so here's, here's where you'll see, see me sit here. And <laughs> here. So I'll, I'll put on my green hat for a moment and I'll say, I love this idea. Um, getting off fossil fuels for, for homes is, is, is good for our planet, without a doubt. Um, however, reach code as it applies to us over here in the ADU space, means that it's a challenge for us um, because the way to do this and meet the energy codes, Title 24, mm -hmm. means that we not only have to switch to electrical appliances, but we have to switch to electrical appliances that don't consume a lot of energy. Right. So they have to be very efficient. So when we talk about the implement, implementation of REACH code, it means tankless gas water heaters are out. It doesn't mean that we get a quick exchange for a tankless electric water heater. That is a big energy consumer. So we run into this weird scenario where as we get down in size in ADUs, we're faced with the only products that work really well are these uh, heat pump water heaters. Mm -hmm. They only come in 40, 60 gallon increments. And so when I'm trying to talk to a city, and I'm not, I'm not going to throw names out here, um, but I'm trying to talk to a city who's implemented reach code and I tell them that, you know, ADUs go down to as low as 150 square feet for efficiency unit sizing. You are now putting me in a position that in order to meet energy code requirements, I have to put a 40 gallon water heater in this 150 square foot space. That means giving up the space that I've allocated for the closet to now be the storage for the water heater. I can't put it up in the ceiling, 40 gallon water heaters don't lay down and they, they come through the roof when you try and Let's extend the in-law in it. <laughs> so so we, we do have a problem here and, and I, I get the intent, but I struggle with the application. I love the idea as it applies to 1200 square foot homes and up. 
not a problem to use a 40 gallon um, heat pump water heater. You exchange it for the other one that's the same size yeah. and you get more efficient energy consumption. ADUs are actually energy efficient by design. Yeah. When we talk about occupants, right? I mean, the North, in California, the household occupancy rate has puts us now per occupant to, to something like almost 1200 square feet based on the mathematics or something like that. So it means that we're designing energy code around a model that doesn't take what we are doing as an industry into, into consideration. And, the, and, the, and a rule like this comes in faster than the industry can invent products that fit this sizing. Yeah. So here we are, we've got a problem on our hands and we have to have dialogue with the cities about understanding what it means as we try and force this application on ADUs. Well, we have a few more years to solve that problem. Um, hopefully they'll, yeah, more dialogue with planning, more dialogue with the city officials, more dialogue with communities to help them to understand some of these codes that they have pu actually pushed for. Um, all right, so my last question coming up top of the hour, I'm gonna attribute it to a friend of mine, Lauren Hood, who always ends her presentation with a request. So my question to you is, what would you like from us, from the rest of us in the, in the ADU space. What would you like to see? What would you like to have us do? What would you like to see from us as a community? I'm, this is actually gonna be an easy one for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I operated in this space for many, many years by myself, wondering will, will, I, ever, will I ever run into people who understand what I'm doing and and and, and take part in this. Your family. Uh, <laughs> it, it's been it's been a really great, but but you know, 2017 changed that and, and it opened the doors for everyone. But we've added a few years to that now, and what we've got is we've got something that has moved to competition. And and what I need, what I would love to have happen is 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 two things. I'd love for people in this space to succeed on the merits of what value they bring to the consumer, not on belittling someone else within their space that they're considering their competition. Um, when, we, when we speak disparagingly of, of other people in this space, we're not helping to promote growth of this industry we're, we're instilling fear in the consumer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a negative thing. Um, so be cognizant of what you're doing and how you represent yourself um, in conversing as well as online. Yeah. Um, succeed by having a strong value proposition to your consumer and know your lane. Um, you know, this industry has several lanes. And I think that's something that a lot of people still haven't really seen or come to terms with. I don't do custom homes anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm not threatened by sitting in a room with an architect. I think that we can all serve the space independently as well as consider serving the space together. Yeah. Um, and with that, I don't, it's the same rules apply to how I see conventional construction builders. I, I work on, on an efficiency model that very much limits my capability to be anything and everything to everybody. Right. Um, and there are customers who demand that. And, and my goal is to have good referrals to, to turn those people to. The same rules should apply across the board. Know your lane, be good at what you do, excel in that lane, and then think about expansion outside of that lane from that point on. If you see somebody out there that may represent a competitor, don't, don't automatically put yourself in that person's lane. Try and understand their lane and yours and try and see how you can succeed with that. And, and we have a Casita coalition now because the goal here is to work together as an industry to succeed, which means as a group, we table problems together and together we find ways to find resolutions so the industry as a whole succeeds. We can't do that while we're simultaneously um, burning bridges all around us. That's so I say, I say get very cognizant of that and make sure 
that you're clear on what you're doing and how you're doing it. And that way you don't have to leave, you know, damaged roadways and bridges behind you as you move forward with a client. It's not necessary. There's space in here for everyone. I'll give you mathematics. There are 9 million single family homes in, in California. The market potential at 25% adoption rate is two and a quarter million. I doubt with the 29 people here on, online right now that we're gonna saturate that and be in a situation where we need to be ugly against each other to be successful. It's not, right. yeah. it's not real. Don't, don't make it real. I agree, I agree. I, I, yes, the important thing is impact and intentionality about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, uh, Jamora, we are open for questions. Am, am, I, am I leading the questions or are you doing the Q&A? Is she back with us? Let's see, I'll just do it. From Stuart Highland, has any work been done at the state level to standardize the product prefab units that will simplify the inspection process for city staff and the owner? Daily. Um, I mean, that, those, those rules um, predate all of us. They, they even roll back to, you know, before 1976 when different rules were applied um, and a separation from mobile homes transitioned into manufactured homes. There is, there is, there, historically, there was a lot of uh, manuals that went from the state, from HCD to cities, and I've been trying to communicate with them about updating those manuals with the understanding that, you know, the last, I think the last one on, on like manufactured housing was, was dated 2001. So, you know, 19 years later, I think it's time to actually update that manual and make sure it gets out to the city staff. There's been a high turnover of city staff since 2001, given an opportunity to succeed by making sure they're educated about what their role is. So I've had lots of conversations with HCD about this. I've even given them a, a versions of the manual that some of them forgot even existed. So hopefully we'll see some updates to those soon. All right, Dove Cadence asks, do you have a feel for what kind of savings the pre-approved plans provide on your end? Um, that's, a, that's a very long loaded question to ask. I'll, I'll give you some simple ideas though. For us, when we work with a client on a pre-approved plan, we made the agreement with the city that we will offer that plan for free. It's not a sellable plan, so it, it's free. The city took the decision that they are not issuing the plans or anything, they're just providing a link to the resource with them. So the consumer has to reach out to us. We, what we don't provide for free is if we actually have to generate a site plan or things. But what we've seen there is, is there's a savings of, on, on the, I'll give a low to high end, a savings of maybe six or $7,000 up yeah. to maybe $15,000 or more, depending on who they're talking to or what kind of options they're looking at. Then it goes into construction. Anytime we're working with a pre-approved plan with what we're doing on our end, it's a high production product. So the economics tend to lend in the favor of, of speed and, and a little bit of economic savings on, on the actual um, overall cost of building installation. Yeah, I would agree. I'm finding the same thing that by provide, having standard plans early, um, about 65% DD, they're saving about eight to 10,000 because then we can develop the CD set to match the site after. Um, all right, from anonymous attendee, can you please add a little more about the regulatory differences between manufactured ADUs and prefab ADUs under HCD versus HUD regulations? Okay. HUD versus okay. HCD. So when we talk about HUD regulations, um, uh, Housing and Community Development is actually a department within the state. Really, we're talking about the umbrella for everything there. So when we, when we talk about differences, we're talking about the differences between manufactured and what they call factory built, which is considered modular in, in, in the kind of the generic sense, and then panelized. So these are three different products. These are three of the more common products, I'll say, right now out there. Manufactured falls under a federal ruling, and that is, that is basically nationwide, there is a, um, there is a, 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 a program for manufactured homes that sets the guidelines for, for across the nation. Each state has a little bit of a different role. We're, we're a seismic state and a high wind state um, because we're coastal. So we have different rules that we apply, and we, we have been more on the green standards. So we have a state-regulated code 
So that's a little bit different. But generally speaking, plans, even foundations, um, can get a state approved stamp and the city has to acknowledge them providing the foundation state approved stamp meets the guideline criteria of the lot you're looking at. Most of them nowadays, they design the foundation to meet seismic zone D3, mm -hmm. but there's an exception. If you're within X distance from a, a, a fault line, then you might be in a territory where that's not gonna work. If you're on a, a significant slope or if you're, if you're in a liquefaction zone. So there's always gray areas in there on different things. So, but generally speaking, it's, a, it's umbrellaed under a state approved product. The city kind of rubber stamps it with the understanding that we'll inspect the foundation after it's, it's installed, we'll inspect the house after it's tied to the foundation, and we'll do a final inspection after everything utility wise is brought in and turned on um, to make sure that the house powers up right, the fire, the fire alarms, or, uh, smoke detectors and everything work right. Um, and, and then we'll sign off on the state stamp and then you, you, you consider it done. On the modular side, it's a little bit different. You're actually talking about the local building code applies. So the modular home has to be compliant to the local building code requirements. It's built off site, it's portions of it are inspected off site, but it's built to the local code. So that means the city has the right to review the entire plan set to make sure that it's in compliant with local code, compliance with local code. So the two actually could end up looking like the exact same product in terms of its shipping value and then installed value, but we're talking about two different codes there. Panelized is essentially a site built product. The panels are built off site. If they're just wood panels, there's no inspections off site. They come to the site and they're tilted up and you have a standard framing inspection. If there are other components that are built in and the panels are closed, that requires a state third party inspection because the city has no longer any ability to inspect what's going on inside. So that has to be done at the factory. So that's my best way of describing the differences. I could go on for probably about four hours on digging much deeper into this, but I don't think we have the time for that today. <laughs> All right, next question from Jane Blumenfeld. Steve, can you talk about the cost of ADUs you're building and if any of the forms of prefab have reduced, I guess she's talking to reduce traditional costs. So prefab versus traditional is what I'm interpreting. Um, I, I, can say, I can say yes and just blanket this across the board, but I can also say that, you know, there, there's always variations in circumstances. Um, the industry is an evolving thing. I, I, I did a presentation once and I, I projected on the screen behind me, you know, 10 products that we offer and what the installed um, retail prices of those things. I had a realtor from the audience pop up and said, you know, I have a contractor who could do that at X dollars cheaper. And my response to that is that that will happen. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sitting here saying that we are always going to be the cheapest solution out there. Um, my value to the customer is that we do a lot of these and your contractor may be able to do one or two. At any given time, we're doing 15 to 20 of these things at a time. Um, so there's variations in terms of interpretation of where value is actually really, really um, attained by the consumer. Um, on a onesie twosie basis, that scenario might, might be a beat against what I have to offer almost every time if we come head to head. I will tell you this, um, what we do that I think everybody can implement across the board of what they're doing is we focus on hev heavily on all decisions on the front end. Um, when you do prefab, there's no room and there's no time for making decisions as you go. If we're gonna stick to our timeline about how we get in and get out, all the decisions have to be made up front. And we're not talking about decisions any part of the process. What that does is it guarantees locking a number on the front end that is actually the real number out the back end. So if we wanna get into logistics about me answering this question a different way, how does prefab compare to people out there conventional costs? I will tell you, you can't look at the bid number, you have to look at the actual number. 
And when we do that, we are, we are heavily weighted on the bid number is the actual cost. Conventional building is traditionally has not been because of the fact, it's not because they, they stink or they, you know, or they rob people. It's because they don't implement the same decision process on the front end as a mandate. And that, that opens the door for a lot of evolution and up and down in the overall project pricing and timeline. And that affects the consumer and the service provider in a negative way. So use, use the ideology, even if you're not using the methodology. Yeah, we, we, okay, we don't have any other questions, but I do wanna follow up on that because what you are addressing is, um, you know, we call it programming, pre-design, you, do, you know, do, your due diligence, but this is the average homeowner. So it's a lot about spending the time, being very honest in questions, making sure that the homeowner is aware of the decisions that they're making, but also that they're aware of their, the issues in the past about, I don't want to berate, but, but we have the, the number and dollar value around lawsuits in the remodel industry is astronomical. And a large part of it, of course, has to do with change orders. Um, but, what you're what you're shining a light on is we can avoid a lot of these acrimonious relationships um, impact and have a very efficient construction schedule by having early firm clear transparent discussions at the beginning of a project with the owner so that they're completely aware of the decisions that they're making and that there is no room except for maybe paint color no room for changes, no room for, you know, the latest home show ideas. Um, and so that's onus on us, both prefab as well as traditional, and that impacts costs. I completely agree with you that we can't just, the bid has to be the real. The bid and the contract value that is signed by the owner, that is part of our responsibility to make sure we arrive at that dollar value at the end. Now I can understand if you're on a hillside slope or something else, that civil engineer didn't catch or whatever wasn't caught, but it is in our, our job to make sure that when we have those early discussions that we're being very clear, very transparent, and the owner understands, because honestly, I know many times the owner does not understand. Yeah. They're, they're, have, they're new to this, you're the professional. That's right. You understand your role in this and, and, and do, your, do your part as being the professional. I come out of the commercial, commercial world. So for me, you know, multi-million dollar commercial projects that I was tied into building hospitals and, and you know, and, and different things, I, I'm very clear about timelines, budgets, and, and things like that. So for me, coming into this space, this was an easy thing to scale the project down to this big and, and apply those rules. What I see is I see a continuation of, of, of a growth from a, from a field role mm -hmm. into an ownership and then, and then taking on building homes there's there's a you're coming at it from you know not having this as your as your basic understanding of the rules i'm giving you the tools now or, or at least trying to to have a better understanding of how to make those things work for you and the customer and and, and make it a win for everybody all right we have some more questions what customer preference or trends are you seeing both on the design side floor plan sizing and on consumer and on customer desire for support, like concierge services. Ooh, concierge services. So trends in floor plans, design sizes, and um, concierge services. My answer is this, it's, it's all over the place. Understand your market and your lane. If you, if you understand what you're pursuing, then you can dig deeper into, with the pursuit of that particular client base or that particular product set you can get more clear about about those things i i this again could be an all day it could be a multi-day session getting into that dialogue with hundreds of these for, for me to get to the point where the hundreds are behind me thousands have become thousands are in the record book of dialogue you know to to get to this point but but the things the things I'll tell you that are very simple, and, I'm, and you know, I'm sure you can attest to this kind of stuff very easily as well. 
be efficient with your use of space. Do not lay out space without an understanding of its functional use. Oh, yeah. Put furniture in there and understand how it's going to be used. Make sure you understand flow within that space. If you've got, if you've got three rooms in your ADU, a bathroom, a living room, kitchen area, and a bedroom, you want to understand how that consumer goes in the front door and moves freely to those three spaces and within those spaces how they move freely doing things within those within those spaces if you if you focus on that then you will design you will design and build products that will make people happy that actually represent an opportunity for higher repetition and and if that is your goal I want to piggyback on that because you and I spoke about trends and sizes, which also was part of the question. Because when I was when I did the study last year with AARP, and I was stunned to realize that the average in-law unit size in Seattle, Portland, and Vancouver were 600 and above, and in the Bay Area, what I was seeing was 350, 400, 450. And for a while, it, I looked at this and I was stunned because of, that's a huge difference in size. I'm going to talk about average. So since many are not privy to our conversations, why don't you talk about the fact that we're, we tend to build and why we tend to build smaller in-law units, the right. 450, the 350. Good, good, good question. So when I started in this space, the industry was very difficult to work in urban areas. So rural areas, suburbs was my business for you know, seven years or more. Coming into urban areas was just not a thing. So what that meant was we were dealing with lots that were you know, 7,000 to multi-acre. Mm -hmm. And so when you're dealing with parcels of that, then your, your common products are you know, 650 to 1,200 square feet. That's your common products that you're dealing with. But as, you, as, as the barriers lifted on the urban areas, more and more people in highly dense populated areas are struggling with housing. So the demand starts to increase. And as the demand increases in those areas, you find that you're talking now to Oakland and Berkeley, where the lot sizes are 3,000 to 5,000 square feet. 1,200 square feet is not going to work with a single family <laughs> there in the existing detached garage. So what you're talking about with your sizing becomes more common as we get into those tighter urban areas. So again, this really is about like, like I said, understand your lane and that's where you start to figure out what sizes work better for you. Um, and then with that, you know, your customer and, and their needs um, have a lot of weight on how you consider services and, and that question about concierge and, and, and mm -hmm. such. Um, if you are dealing with affluent homeowners, in affluent communities, um, and this is a cash purchase, um, and I, I, I'm gonna go the extreme with this, but it's a vanity purchase. Right. Um, you're, you're talking about a group that wants heavy handholding um, and extreme flexibility. Um, and so you find that you're, you're, you're in an upcharge role for a much more heavily weighted service on the front end an expectation that that carries over into the construction. And I'm saying the front end meaning on the design side. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that carries over into construction. But if you're, if you're dealing with the other end of the spectrum, you've got a client who is strictly about economics and you're, they're dealing with you know, tight budgets and um, it's, it's an offset for a family member in, you know, who's potentially going to be displaced you know, you're, you're talking about a whole different set of rules here that you're working with from the consumer's perspective. Speed and economics mm -hmm. become the leading factors. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to tie speed and econo economics to an efficient solution. And so when you talk about your concierge service, you're really talking about how do you bundle that to fit their needs so they're not bouncing around and you're getting too many players in the pot for working with their own needs for individual profit, profitability. And, and I say that it's, it's not to say one is right, one is wrong. I'm just giving you ends of spectrum viewpoints so that you can understand the consumer's mindset. It just shows you how wide the market truly is. All right, Jane's back, Jane Blumenfeld. When you provide pre-approved plans, 
do they replace or reduce the role of the architect? I, I, I can respond to that after you've spoken. <laughs> I, that's absolutely fair. Um, I, 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 won't throw out, I won't throw out replace. Um, I, I think you're talking about definitely reduce. If the plan itself is pre-approved by the city, there, there, there's not much to it. If you alter it, we're moving away from the pre-approved status. So all of that is an option that's on the table for you. It, it, it's, it's decision making and weighing your, your timing and your cost. There are still components that need to be developed that are specific to that client's property and somebody needs to intervene to put that together as a full package and be able to submit that to the city on behalf of the customer or the customer has to do it themselves. So there is a role in there. It's just a question of how far that role goes and how much of that pre-approved plan are you putting at risk with what that client is asking. So it's an understanding of a few variables. Yeah, because in some cities, the pre-approved plans, uh, I'm talking in Arctic speak, is up to 65%. It's just, it tells you what the building looks like. It tells you how big it is, but it doesn't tell you the actual construction details to build that building. And so the permit set still needs to be done. That's in some cities. In other cities, they have a full set. You deviate from that. You need to represent a, a new set of plans with the deviations in it. I think that the pre-approved plan is an absolute market for young architects to start out in. And it also provides the cities to have a whole bunch of pre-approved plans because the city is not saying we will only have one design set in office and it's pre-approved, I only approve this, this, this package. No, what it says is you as an architect can create a set of pre-approved plans or plans that you would like to have approved and have it be a standard that is accepted by the city. So it's actually an opportunity, I see it as an opportunity for architects to play a proactive role of solving a problem for the city and solving the problem for the average individual who has no time to learn about what it takes to sit down and talk to an architect and how do you hire an architect and what do I need to think about. So, just filling that gap by providing information early on and, and, the, and the homeowner being aware that the city has approved a certain set of documents starts to educate the homeowner. And that actually gives them a lot of trust because they're not talking to me where I, they might think I'm selling. They're looking at an official document that they can make their decisions on. And I think that's important. That third, it plays a third party trust role, which we are missing to a large extent in the market. I'll, I'll put one caveat on that, and it's not against anything you say, it's, it's a condition. It's provided the entity that had this opportunity to express the value of this to the city, did it in a way that it's beyond self-serving and made sure the city knew that whatever it is that they are talking about one-on-one -on -one should be designed as an open system to allow other solutions providers to utilize it as well. This is where we need to work better as an industry, not thinking only about ourselves. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I think we have, let me see if I can merge these two from Anonymous. What kind of impacts have you seen from the current crisis on homeowner inquiries and tastes over the past two months? What factors do you think are driving this behavior? I haven't seen a change in taste. I've seen a change in urgency. I mean, a spike I, I'll, in urgency. I'll, I'll agree with you. Um, taste is a... Taste is a later, later piece in the process for most people. It surfaces early, but economics play heavily on, on other factors that leave taste to the later part of the decision-making process. Um, you, you're talking about sizing, placement, which, which are really the, the, key, the key upfront things that need to, to, to happen. This is my second economic downturn that I've been through in this industry. In both scenarios, we have seen upticks because the urgency associated with, um, with family members and different people who are at risk of losing housing um, and, and health and safety um, creates a, a, a drive, a, a, an uptick in demand. Yeah, okay, our last question. How can we better educate customers about the potential of ADUs and speed adoption, especially for non-vanity populations? What has worked well for you? So how do we educate the average customer? My general feeling is that they actually more, know more than we give them credit. Um, my experience working with various income levels, everyone's aware of the granite flat. 
They, they may not know it as an ADU, but they'll know it as a granite flat. They know the benefit additional income. Um, so they're not, in, they're not ignorant of the income potential. Um, so what is it that you think we could better educate customers or potential ADU customers about? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go Mark Cuban on, on, on this whole group <laughs> and this, this question. Um, you, you have to be clear about the fact that you're not hunting for a win for you, mm -hmm. that you're hunting for a win for your consumer. And that you have to open your mind to an understanding of what their fears and their concerns are and what triggers them to increase their confidence in you and your solution. Um, I'm going to be generic like that because I can't give you an answer of what works for me because what works for me is understanding them as it applies to me. But understand that that is the method that, that, that gets you to that answer. You, you, have to, you have to make that connection. When we talk about this generally and speaking about the group overall, um, I'll go back to that comment. We got 9 million people, 9 million homes that we have to connect with. Generally speaking, a good portion of that population has heard about the ADU, but they haven't been, they haven't been introduced to the value proposition to them. Get past the standard boilerplate value proposition and get into understanding your market and who you're working for and what their pain points are and how you will help them solve it. That is how you get to the non-vanity mm -hmm. product. Um, it's empathy. Yeah. Put yourself in their shoe. Okay. Sorry, I give you a better right. That's a whole session. <laughs> <laughs> I think mom's back. Are you there, Shamara? Where did she go? There she is. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right, that's enough kids. <laughs> well, that was a really great discussion. So thank you so much. Um, it was really, um, Wonderful to hear from our two uh, Bay Area experts, a prolific ADU builder and wonderful architect. Um, and we're really lucky to have your expertise um, lend itself to the Casito Coalition. Um, with that, uh, just a friendly reminder, we have our last of the series next Friday. So please, again, tune in, same time, same place, 3.30 till 4.30. Um, Steven Dietz of United Dwelling. Uh, focus in the LA area, just uh, his perspective of the challenges and opportunities for ADU creation there. Uh, we are a statewide coalition, so we like to hear both from the Bay Area and Southern California. Um, with that, I just want to thank everyone again uh, for your time and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Can, sure. I, can I put one more thing out yeah. there? <laughs> because we are Casita Coalition. Yes. Um, um, June and I um, head up the, um, the prefab and the ADU code um, side of the house. And, and so what we look to from all of you is keep us abreast of barriers that you're running into, whether it's an individual barrier with one municipality or whether you're seeing it ripple effect into other areas. The only way we can re remove barriers is if we're aware of them and we're understanding um, the impact and then we can look at how we roll that into efforts to pursue legislative activity to remove those barriers. Absolutely. Yes, so uh, we'll be sure to circulate your contact information um, to the group so they could plug in and learn how to get more involved. Great, thank you, Jamara. Excellent. Have a great Bye. weekend, everybody. Have a great, great weekend. weekend. Bye. Thank you. Bye.